Welcome back to the Explanation Pro. Today I'll recap an American war drama film called Beasts of No Nation. Spoilers incoming. A civil war is breaking out in an unspecified West African country. A young boy, Agu, lives in a small village within a buffer zone enforced by Ekamad troops. He reveals that due to the ongoing war, every African child can longer go to school safely, and they must occupy their free time having fun whenever they can. He and his friends entertain the troops with their so-called imagination TV, apparently just an empty television frame. They try selling it to a guard on duty, who is amused at their antics and sends them away with piles of food. Agu returns to his home as he helps his mom, a good cook, while his father, a teacher, is busy not just with teaching but supporting refugees during the war. He also has an annoying older brother, who loves picking on him, and a younger sibling. He grows up in a very religious setting as the family always participates in church-related activities to ease their sorrows over the war. On one occasion, to acquire some money, his brother, his friend, and his brother block a road with a tree branch and force passing vehicles to give a toll. Later, a mad old woman berates them for their ruse and curses them for stealing her land to welcome refugees. On the way home, Aga thinks more about what the woman said and sees some people along the road as they struggle to live normally during the war. He later discusses the matter with his family, and his father insists she is lying. After a good laugh at the family dinner, he bickers with his older sibling, who chases him out of the house. Moments later, the power shuts off throughout the whole community. The following morning, while Agu and his older brother take water from the pumping station, they see a girl from the church that the latter tries to impress by flexing his muscles. As she and her friends leave, he tells his brother that she will soon have feelings for the two of them. Sometime in the afternoon, Ekamad soldiers enter the village with their armored tanks and instruct the villagers to pack their surplus and leave, as the current government has fallen and military-aligned rebels have seized control of the country. At a community meeting, Agu's family watches as the village chief insists they cannot evacuate from their homes because they must keep them safe for their ancestors' sake. The men, including Agu's father, agree that they must protect the community, arguing about the rebellion. That night, while playing checkers, Agu and his brother listen to their parents quarrel over the upcoming evacuation, with their father begging his wife to take Agu and his sister far away from the war zone so that he can stay behind with his eldest son. A new day arrives, and with rebel forces headed toward the village, many people flee to the country's capital for safety. Agu's father buys safe transport for his wife and two youngest children. Unfortunately, he argues with a driver, who will only allow his wife and daughter to come aboard, excluding Agu. With no options left, Agu weeps as his mother leaves him behind and rides the car filled with many refugees intending to flee. The little boy pulls away from his father and runs after the car but cannot catch up with it. His brother comforts him and brings him home. After surviving a heavy storm, rebel and government forces fight in and around the village a few days later. Agu is running through an abandoned market when his father finds him, as an exchange of gunfire is heard. The residents cower in fear, not knowing if they will die or get shot. Agu and his family hide in a nearby warehouse, along with others, while the streets are flooded with rebels. As they wait in fear for their safety, Agu's father peeks through the bullet holes and sees a military convoy looking around for the insurgents. He assures the boy that this is but a test of God and they will be saved soon. Unfortunately, as the tank shoots rebels close by the warehouse, one of the residents freaks out and opens the door, only to be executed by the military. Now that most rebel soldiers have fled, the soldiers round up the remaining villagers inside and line them up for inspection. As Agu and the others kneel, holding their hands behind their heads, the military unit introduces themselves as part of the armed forces of the NRC, National Reformation Council, with their leader accusing the villagers of being involved with the rebellion. They bring in the madwoman to confirm that Agu and his family are residents, but she claims not to recognize any of them. The captain orders to execute them, but Agu and his older brother evade capture, running through every small pathway out of the village. However, since they left their father behind, the soldiers did not hesitate to shoot him and the rest. As the two boys try to escape, Agu's brother gets shot in the back, forcing him to flee to the jungle alone. At night, he stops to catch his breath and cries in anguish. In the morning, he chances upon an abandoned hut and finds something to eat inside. Later, unable to light a fire for cooking, he throws a fit out of desperation. To sate his hunger in the meantime, he tries eating some leaves, which nauseate him. Just then, he sees an unusual figure dressed in a tribal outfit, leaving as soon as the boy chases him. After wandering for an unspecified period, 
Agu is caught in a guerrilla skirmish. After getting knocked out by a soldier, he is brought to members of the Native Defense Forces, NDF, a rising rebel faction in the country. The commandant is alerted and asks a young soldier, Stryka, to untie him. He calls for another young soldier, 2IC, to see if Agu is fit for their unit. Though he claims he is a mere child, the commandant sees potential in the boy as he looks at his hands. He wonders why Agu somehow ended up in their camp, to which the boy reveals that radical government units have murdered his father and brother. Feeling somewhat compassionate over his plight, he adopts Agu into their ranks as he will personally train the boy until he is strong enough to avenge his fallen family members. He later carries an ammunition case with Stryka into the forest as everyone moves out. The soldiers chant as they make the journey back to their base. Two IC Lates prepares Agu and the young hostages for the initiation process to make them officially part of the NDF. After settling in and getting to experience the militia lifestyle, he gathers with a group that is having lunch. As he begs for food, another soldier, Preacher, makes fun of him. Stryka is immediately called for by the commandant, as Agu wonders if he will be looked after soon. He is later trained along with the recruits on carrying firearms effectively. 2IC later fills the recruits with war propaganda, teaching them how the NDF has been fighting the NRC forces since establishing a political party known as the UPC. Agu continues doing menial tasks for the militia, delivering water to the soldiers while they play a rough game of volleyball. Later, the commandant delivers a speech about fighting to reclaim their freedom. As the militia shouts for victory, Agu feels inspired to fight back for his family, as he has never been part of something revolutionary like this. The day comes for the recruits to go through the final stages of their initiation. After being inducted in a ritualistic ceremony, they are beaten, pierced on the neck with a blade, and laid on shallow graves to represent rebirth. The next day, they line up in front of a firing squad, who shoot blank bullets to convey that they have passed the test. The commandant rejoices for the new brood and lets them perform a dance symbolizing fortification. After a rousing speech, he later orders the men to burn down all the huts as they leave for new territory. Another day passes, and the militia is on the move. On a radio transmission, the Supreme Officer talks with the Commandant about the militia's duties, saying their group should be proud of being a freedom fighter. Agu and the soldiers carry an assortment of supplies as they all make their way through the jungle terrain leading to their headquarters. Later, the child soldiers hide under a bridge to prepare for an ambush. As they wait, Agu sees the lot smoke cigarettes and inhale a cocaine-like substance called Brown Brown. An enemy convoy approaches the bridge, which leads the young soldiers to come out firing with RPGs and assault rifles. The militia is commanded to search the wreckage as they mark the location. A bald man brought to the commandant begs him to be spared as he claims to be an engineering student working on the bridge, not a military member. Ignoring his plea, the commandant instructs Agu to kill the man with a machete, but the young recruit feels pity and cannot bring himself to kill someone in cold blood. The commandant becomes agitated, telling him that the man is one of those responsible for killing his father. Feeling the need to exact vengeance, he strikes the machete in the man's head and butcher him to death as Stryka joins him. Right after that, 2IC hands him a gun he can use from now on, becoming a full-fledged militia member. Out of guilt and horror with what he did, he vomits. Later, Aga meets with Stryka, handing him some new gear. They start a friendship and talk about each other's feelings about the war, even if Stryka is a silent child. After some time traveling, they play with other boys as more experienced militia members like Preacher go hunting. Late at night, as the mood becomes jovial, some scouts inform the commandant about a few local women asking for the militia's help to reclaim their village from the PLF armed forces. They agree to visit the location, where a few soldiers led by two IC are pinned down by heavy gunfire as they intend to take over the bridge. The commandant then shows Agu how to use the monocular to see the men fighting the enemies from a distance. He later bolsters the men's morale and prepares them to retaliate against the PLF. The militia advances, shooting from all sides as they march triumphantly on the streets. That night, the soldiers honor their fallen compatriots as Agu and others empty their pockets for items. The boy finds something valuable and brings it to Stryka, who leads him inside the commandant's office. After receiving a call from the Supreme Commander about two ICs promotion, the commandant talks to a spirited Agu, who reminds him of his childhood. After promising him he will see his mother again, he brings the boy to his quarters. He gives him a cloth with unique protective charms, urging him to keep it a secret. He sniffs some cocaine to loosen him enough to sexually assault Agu. Moments later, the boy, still shaken from the experience, 
is comforted immediately by Stryka, revealing himself to be one of the Commandant's rape victims. As the day breaks, he sees Preacher, who offers him Brown Brown to lift his mood before they go to a meeting. Agu and Stryka participate in several more bloody battles and ambushes, which catch the United Nations' attention. During one raid, Agu sees a woman he recognizes as his mother. He exclaims that he found her and clings to her while the other group members declare they want to rape her. Unfortunately, she does not recognize him, so he insults her, calling her a witch woman. One of the other child soldiers drags the woman's young daughter and stomps her to death as Agu participates. Reflecting on his actions, he wonders if God sees what he is doing. He then shoots the woman while she is being molested on a bed. Later, the town leaders are rounded up and stuffed with grenades as the commandant watches them be tortured. The battalion's many victories earn them summons to the rebel headquarters in Taro, where the commandant, accompanied by Agu, Stryka, and a few other soldiers, wait all night outside the office for NDF leader Dada Good Blood. Everyone eventually gets impatient, so some rations and water are brought to tide them over. They spend the rest of the night in the lounge area before they are allowed to enter in the morning. Upon meeting the leader, he discusses with the commandant the importance of public image in the wake of the conflict becoming world news. Unfortunately, he denies the commandant the promotion to general as he promised over the phone and removes him from command. 2 IC will take control of the battalion, while he will be made deputy chief of security under good blood. Viewing this as an extreme insult, he leaves to celebrate one more night with his men at a brothel. The den's mother welcomes them with open arms as she asks the young women to serve beer. While Agu and Stryka keep an eye on the weapons, the rest spend the night with the brothel's women, with one of them accidentally shooting 2 IC while fooling around. He accuses the commandant of orchestrating the incident before dying, while he insists it must have been a botched attempt against himself. The prostitute begs for her life, but he orders his men to shoot her before promptly leaving the brothel. Later, on his deathbed, 2 IC tells Agu that their fight is all for nothing. After 2 IC's funeral, the commandant informs everyone that good blood is the new enemy. Now on the run from their own faction and their enemies, the militia suffers heavy losses from a bombing raid at night. Later, Airstrikes and supply shortages kill many of them, including Stryka, even after Agu tries desperately to revive him. They cover his body in palm fronds and walk away. The remaining battalion members take shelter at a gold mine for several months, hoping to find gold to pay for supplies. At one point, Agu calls on his mother in vain, fearing that God is no longer listening to him. Ammunition runs out, leaving the group with no way to defend themselves from encroaching enemy forces. Following a confrontation between a frustrated preacher and paranoid commandant, Agu and the soldiers all abandon the commandant, ignoring his warnings that they will merely be thrown in jail and disowned by their families. Disappointed, he lets them surrender to the Ekamod. Before being detained, Agu recognizes one of the troops he sold the television frame to some time ago. The younger members of the militia are sent to a missionary school in a safe part of the country. Agu stays away from the other children, who play games and enjoy the comfort and safety of the school. As his post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms increase, he suffers from withdrawal, having endured terrible conditions in the war. He also has trouble sleeping peacefully at night because of recurring nightmares. Meanwhile, after a camp bonfire session, Preacher and another boy, Randy, decide to run away to rejoin the war and earn some money again. After some time passes, Agu goes into therapy. He tells the school's counselor, Amy, that he has done some terrible things, which he fears will make her see him as a beast. He tells of how he used to be a good boy from a family who loved him. As he tries to put the past behind him, Agu finally enjoys his freedom, joining the other boys as they swim and play in the ocean. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video please hit the like button and also subscribe my channel for more videos like this. See you in the next video.